and welcome everyone. Um, I would love to say good afternoon, but I'm hoping that we have some folks on the West Coast who are joining us today. I am so grateful to be back here with Healthy Churches, and I am just so grateful um, for uh, Dr. Tornessa Seal and, and her vision. Um, many of you must know her and have worked with her in the past, and again, just want to thank her so much for the invitation for, for me to come back. Yes, I'm Dr. Karen Wheatfield. I'm a radiation oncologist. I've been associated with Healthy Churches since 2016, and I'm very pleased to be back. And I want to thank the Healthy Churches family. Thank you for being here and for prioritizing this information about health and well-being that you can take back to your churches, to your congregations, and especially now with this COVID going on. Uh, this has really changed the dynamics of everything that we do. And so while I'm going to miss being there in person with you, I'm grateful that you're here today uh, on this uh, live webinar. And for those of you who are listening later on, welcome. So two years ago, um, I had the privilege of being involved uh, in healthy churches. And at that time, I made the announcement that my husband had passed away. And there were so many of you who prayed for me, who were there for me, and I wanna thank you for that. It's never easy to lose a loved one. And so I'm thinking about all of those who may have lost a loved one in the last few years. It definitely changes one's perspective. And so I want to thank you so much for your prayers and for your thoughts. So much has changed since the last time I saw all of you, including the fact that I lost the weight that I promised. Many of you may have remembered four years ago uh, that I had said I wanted to be an example of what we can do to reduce our risk for the development of cancer. Knowing that obesity is one of the leading risk factors, I took it upon myself to find a way to lose the weight. And so here I am. So I want to set that example for you all. And again, I want to thank you so much for those of you who have challenged me to do that. In addition to that change, I moved on to a new job and I'm really hoping to broaden my reach uh, by working with the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance. Many of you may know of, of Meharry uh, Medical Center, which is in Nashville, Tennessee. It's really important for me to give back to my community and be a part of one of the historically black colleges and universities. And I'm so pleased to be able to do that. Regarding today, we're going to talk about cancer. And I've been helping to curate the oncology section of Healthy Churches since 2016, as I've mentioned. And I've always stressed that Dr. Seal insists on bringing excellence. And today is no exception. I am so pleased to introduce my friends and colleagues, Dr. Tiffany Avery and Dr. Zanetta Lamar, both who are oncologists, and I'm going to have them turn on their cameras right now. We are the three black dogs. So welcome, friends. And uh, hey. for those of you who don't we know. We are so happy to be here. Yes, we have a podcast. And so we are going to do this kind of discussion the same way that we do our podcast. Again, we're called the Free Black Doc, the number three Black Doc COCS. And we'll put that information in the chat box for you so you can check out some of our podcasts that we've already done. Um, but first, I want to actually start with letting you know who these individuals are who are sitting in front of you. And I'm going to start with my colleague, Dr. Tiffany. So why don't you tell the people a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you, Karen. Again, I'm so excited to be here today. So thank you for the invitation to participate. My name is Tiffany Avery. I am a medical oncologist. I did my fellowship training down at MD Anderson um, in Houston. And uh, since then, uh, the last 10 years, I've been uh, mainly involved in academics. So I've been um, doing research into patients with breast cancer, uh, taking care of breast cancer patients, um, getting funding to run clinical trials in breast cancer care, and have also had funding uh, to study disparities, which I'm sure we're going to talk about, which is um, the fact that Black people die more from cancer uh, than white people, than anyone really. Um, and so I've also had funding to study that, and that has really been the focus um, of my career. So at this point, I am not in academics anymore. I have struck out, um, just like you said, trying to really broaden my reach and really focused in on getting into our community, getting the information that people need so we can really start to move the needle on cancer disparities. So thank you. I'm also a co-host of Free Black Docs with you, Dr. Karen, and Dr. Zanetta, who is coming up, um, which is just a great joy of mine right now. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to this. Dr. Z. All right. I am so excited to be here uh, when I heard that 
Um, we had the opportunity to participate. I cannot tell you how excited I was. I am a physician, but let me tell you how I started. I grew up in the church. My father is a pastor. My grandfather is a pastor. And uh, I know church. And, and I always said, I've always wanted to be a doctor, actually, since I was three years old. And I remember I would pray and I said, God, if you let this happen for me, I would not be ashamed. And so I would always say I'm not ashamed uh, of the gospel of Christ. And so I'm so excited to be here. So after um, I finished high school, I went to Grambling State University in Grambling, Louisiana. And after Grambling, I went on to Meharry Medical College. I cannot say enough about Grambling or Meharry, my two HBCUs. And after that, I went to uh, residency and fellowship training in North Carolina at Wake Forest. I stayed on as faculty and I specialized um, in, in a type of blood cancer. And during my time there, I was one of the only funded um, investigators and we opened clinical trials. I wrote my own clinical trials. Um, we published, we did a lot and I actually had a really successful academic career. But you know, sometimes you have to know when it's time to go. And, and um, my time there ended and I moved to Florida and, and, and I changed up a little bit. So I'm no longer in academics. I am a community oncologist. So I'm actually sitting in my office as we speak. I see uh, patients with all kinds of cancers. And one of the things that it has helped me do, I, I, I know a lot about all different types of cancers and I can really meet people where they are. And, you know, along with Dr. Karen and Dr. Tiffany, we are passionate mm -hmm. about empowering people, um, not only to know about cancer, to be able to advocate for yourselves, and one day we're going to see Dr. Karen on the policy level, changing <laughs> things nationally. So That's right. I, I am so excited to be here and I can't wait to get started. Yes, we call her Preacher Z. So <laughs> That's um, right. <laughs> go ahead and listen to our podcast. I'm telling you she breaks it down. Sometimes we have to do our happy dance. When she yes. Does. Um, so so we, most of you, or many of you may remember me. So when I started in 2016, I actually was at Harvard and I was on faculty at Mass General Hospital and um, made a transition that year to a leadership role at Wake Forest. And that's where I met these two lovely ladies. And so Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I was one of the associate directors of the Cancer Center with a focus on community outreach and engagement because what's the sense of there being all this amazing discovery in cancer, right? We're doing all these clinical trials and there's all this amazing stuff going on. If the community is not aware, and if there are some communities that are disenfranchised and not able to participate. And as Dr. Avery mentioned, Dr. Ted talked a little bit about the disparities. And I must say these disparities exist as we've talked about before across the board in medicine, right? Yes. It doesn't matter if you're talking about diabetes or high blood pressure, obesity, cancer, AIDS, you know, infant mortality, black people are dying of these diseases and have the heaviest disease burden. And so it's really important that we get out there and educate communities and we try to figure out ways that we can reach into communities to give them what they need. And so with that, you know, Dr. Z touched on a little bit, but, but Dr. Avery, talk a little bit about why we even wanted to do a podcast. <laughs> I think it was a rant um, of mine, actually. Um, so as we mentioned, you know, we work together personally, the three of us talked mm -hmm. a lot about disparities and we did a lot of work in it. So for us, it was second nature. It has been for our entire careers that, you know, we know black people die more from cancer, from, you know, everything um, and that and that we've really worked towards it. So when the COVID pandemic hit, um, and it was front page and on the news every night that Black people were dying more from coronavirus. None of us were surprised, but it mm -hmm. seemed like the rest of the country was. Right. And, you know, we were kind of like, why is everybody acting like this is some new phenomenon? This has gone on forever and we have recognized this forever um and so that kind of brought up the point that i don't think that we you know in the academic community have done a great job in getting the message out there to the folks who are affected by this because by this point it shouldn't be news to anybody right um and so we started the podcast where we 
actually sit around and have the conversations that we were having anyway when coronavirus drove us to Zoom happy hours, um, where we would just talk about what we were seeing in terms of um, unequal rates of deaths and why that was happening, and then how what we know about cancer and how all of that kind of feeds into cancer and the pandemic and all of these things. And so the podcast happened really organically, um, as you know, but we on the podcast discuss basic cancer information, but we also discuss why we see the differences that we see. Mm -hmm. um, and really, we just want our community who is affected by all of this to know about these differences, to kind of start to think about how we can address them, because we can address them everywhere from mm -hmm you personally to your community up to your policy and you know what kind of advocacy you can get involved mm -hmm. with um politically and so there's a lot of opportunity for us to move the needle but folks have to know it exists um and think about how we can all contribute and start working towards it yeah, yeah so i mean really with the podcast starting it's just like tiffany said she called you she called me <laughs> and she said, well, you know, we gave two very different perspectives about, uh, about those concerns. And, and Tiffany really just said, we should start a podcast. And so when, when Karen hears the idea that something needs to happen, right. Please right. know it will get done. And, and that's the part that you need to underscore because yeah. I was ranting and then I felt better. And then next right. week we had a producer. Right. And right. we were recording things. So. Yeah. So, and you know, I'll go along. <laughs> hey, okay. Why not? Let's do a podcast. How right. do you do a podcast? Right. 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 <laughs> right. That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. true, though. This but is all is true. true. Yes. It's all true. It's all true. But, you know, there are so many important things that that we discuss on the podcast. And, and we don't have time to talk a little bit right. about everything, but, but I wanna talk a little bit about some of the greatest cancer-related challenges. Again, we're talking about COVID and a lot of the things have all of a sudden become new, as Tiffany says, you know, they're all of a sudden all these people like, oh my goodness, there's disparities that impact the black community. Yeah, we know, right? right? So what, what are some of these, the major cancer-related kind of challenges that we see that are impacting Black families today. And I'm going to start with you, too. So, you know, th there really are so many, and, and, and we don't have time to address them all. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really comes to mind for me has to do with the medical mistrust within mm -hmm. the Black community. So there was a book uh, called Medical Apartheid by here at Washington. And when I read that book, there was a term that I had never heard before called iatrophobia, which is essentially a wait, fear. Wait, wait, slow that down. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was, hello. Iatrophobia. Hey, thank you. Iatrophobia. And, and what that is, it's, it's a fear of medicine. And and why in the world would you say, oh, you know what, I'm not afraid of medicine, I just don't want to take it, or I'm not afraid of going to the doctor, but we really have to think back. I mean, if you go back centuries, um, slaves were used for human experimentation, right? Some of the early heroes of medicine, hmm, I'm looking at you, gynecology. Some of the early heroes of gynecology, they have statues up, mm -hmm. you know, because they were such great surgeons, they experimented on poorly anesthetized slaves. And mm -hmm. so, and, and even slaves that couldn't work in the fields, mm -hmm. they were sometimes rented out for, and, and for, for research. Explain what she means when she says poorly anesthetized. So mm -hmm. any woman who mm -hmm. has had a gynecologic exam mm -hmm. knows what that's like, mm -hmm. okay? So imagine if they were doing surgical procedures without multiple pain surgical procedures. No pain medicines. Okay. And and folks want to wonder why there's mistrust. Okay. I'm sorry, I just had to thank you. That. Thank you. Please, mm. please do. And so, you know, I, I Karen, Tiffany, and I, we've been in a lot of research meetings all the time. And, you know, the question always comes up, hey, how come Black people are not participating? And how can we get more Black people to participate? <laughs> and, and they always say, well, you know, it's because of Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we know that there was a Tuskegee syphilis experiment where people who had syphilis 
were not treated when, when there were treatments for syphilis at the time, but it wasn't just Tuskegee. We have multiple examples. There are examples after examples after examples where the medical community has done a disservice to our community. And so whether or not we realize it or not, just like in church, we talk about generational curses. Mm. There are generational, there's a generational mistrust that can happen with medicine. And so if you feel like every time you go to the emergency room, you have to defend yourself so you mm. could be treated, mm. that's a part of the generational medical mistrust. Yeah. If you feel like, you know what, I can't trust my physician because X, this is yeah, a part of the yeah. generational mistrust. And so how does that impact? We talk about disparities. Mm -hmm. We know we know that we're dying pure and simple. You know, right. Dr. Tiffany pointed that out, but also we're treated less aggressively sometimes mm -hmm. with, with our cancer treatments. And because of this, our outcomes are worse. And yeah. so to me, this is one of the greatest challenges that's facing yeah. our community. And even the fact that even when people are, when, when individuals are self-aware, they oftentimes right. will go to the emergency room and be turned away or go to their provider. So we all have had stories, right? So I treat breast cancer and I treat blood cancer. Again, that's how I know both of you, right? So Dr. Mm -hmm. C is blood cancer, Dr. C is, is breast cancer, right? So I've had 20 something year old black women who go in and talk about they have a lump in their breast and I say, oh, that's, that's nothing. You know, it's probably just fatty deposit or whatever and go on about the business. And lo and behold, they actually had you know, breast cancer and ended up dying a year and a half later because they were not treated well. Right. And so, you know, Tiffany, Dr. Tiffany, talk a little bit about, you know, lack of information, misinformation, disinformation. We're seeing a lot of that even now with the COVID era, you know, who do you trust? And so talk a little bit about that as being a barrier to, to care. Yeah, it's, it, it's a huge barrier, right? Um, and, and I think we've all unfortunately seen um, young women who, um, you know, found something or young folks who found something and they were ignored. So part of this is, you know, really having to advocate for yourself, um, knowing kind of the barriers that are in the medical community, right? And so, you know, if you have a lump in your breast, keep going until somebody puts a needle in that thing and diagnoses it. That's, you know, mm -hmm. off top. But in terms of, you um, you know, barriers to knowledge. So I think within our families and historically, cancer has been like the whispered C word, right? Mm -hmm. right. Nobody wants to talk about it. Everyone's super um, scared about and fearful about cancer. I mean, we are the doctors that no one ever wants to see. And I think we all um, went into oncology knowing that. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand why there's the fear of cancer, but we can't let that fear get in the way of us talking about it um, with our doctors, but also with our families. Yeah. So here are the two big things. The first thing is we have to know um, what the recommendations are for screening mm -hmm. so that we can be on time with our screening. And if, you know, you're seeing a doc um, and they haven't offered you the screening for you to say, what cancer screenings am I eligible for? What should I be getting? Um, because a big part of this is if you are going to have a cancer, you want to catch it as early as you possibly can. And we yeah. don't so, want so, to ignore anything. So go ahead and go name the cancers that we can have, that we do have yeah. screening for. I know there's right. folks who've been in breast this cancer, mm -hmm. breast. breast cancer, start at 40. Uh, with mammograms, prostate cancer, start at 40 with PSAs. Can you repeat that for the people in the back? Yeah, prostate cancer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Just say, come on, black man. Al Get Roker, you, you know, you. Al Roker was diagnosed with prostate yeah. cancer this and week or last week. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, but here's the thing, and we've talked about this before, but there's a lot of confusion about when you should start getting your screening mm. because different societies put out different guidelines. And so mm. the ages can change. But whenever you see an age that is older, ignore it if you're Black. We die right. more from cancer. We get diagnosed later. We get more aggressive types. Yeah. Ignore. Start at the earliest time. Yeah. If you're a woman, that's 40 for mammogram. If you're mm -hmm. a man, that's 40 for PSA. Colon mm -hmm. cancer, 45. Oh, cancer. And I'm here to tell you, colon screening is the easiest of all. If I never, well, PSA yeah, is I probably would, easy because I, I don't know about that. <laughs> I had it done. This it's year. easier than the mammogram, but colon cancer, 
45. Um, yes. Um, and so, oh, and also, if you are a heavy smoker, yes, lung, lung cancer. for lung cancer, where you uh -huh. can get a CAT uh -huh. scan if you are a heavy smoker. Yes. And so cervical please, cancer. I'm sorry, say right. it again. And cervical, and cervical cancer. And cervical cancer. That's women's uh, parts. Which is women's your lady parts, parts. right? <laughs> um, which should start in your 20s. So you should be having these conversations with your gynecologist. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is being open and talking about this within our families, because right. the other thing that impacts your screening is your family history. Yes. Can you repeat that for the people in yes. the desk? The other thing that impacts your Thank screening you. is your family history. And so family history. Can I get an amen? Come yeah. on, know and so, your family know history. Your fa sure. and we You've got to start talking about this. You have this. to talk about we it. We can't keep whispering that aunt so-and-so died of what, and right. no one wants to say it. And then don't you dare have another family reunion without talking about your family history. Yes. Oh. And and if you get cancer, it's cancer of the lady part. Which lady part? As mm. an oncologist, we need to know because you know it makes a difference if it was a breast or an ovary or uterus or what or cervix. Right. Right. So, or skin. So yes. we need to be specific, please. Yes. But yes. the thing is, if you have a strong family history you might be eligible to start screening even younger Earlier. than yeah. 40s yeah. for breast cancer, yeah. right? Yeah. Even younger for colon cancer, way yeah. younger in some instances, depending on what's going on. Yeah. Um, and so we really need to start talking about this in our families yeah. um, and just putting <clears throat> it out there and mm -hmm. um, not having <clears throat> such a taboo around the cancer. Now, now Dr. Z, Dr. Z, one, one of the questions in the, in the Q and A's, okay, so please folks, if you're listening and you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. That's why I'm going to look not in the chat. Please put them in the Q&A. What's about pancreatic cancer? Now, November is pancreatic cancer awareness month. Yes. And my boy, Alex Trebek. Oh, my God. I don't yeah. know how many months Alex, ever uh, I got, right? Succumbed. And it was interesting. What is sadness? Like, well, well, they're like, pancreatic cancer is new. It's not. It's just not one of the cancers that we screen for. That's right. And it is, there are some signs and symptoms, but not many. So, so Dr. Z, let's, can you take this real quick? Let's, let's talk about that with the pancreatic cancer. Okay. Now, now, you know, you don't have the typical um, screening test for pancreatic cancer like you do for colon or breast cancer. But we know that pancreatic cancer impacts Black people more. One of the things that you really need to watch out for, if you are recently diagnosed with diabetes, mm. Diabetes. Diabetes. Well, mm. because what, what the pancreas does, it helps to regulate insulin, helps to regulate your blood sugars. Mm. So, you know, if you are someone, you know, you all of a sudden it's later on in life and you're getting diabetes, you need to think about, you know, could this be a sign of pancreatic cancer? Another thing that pancreatic cancer does, it can, you can have pain in your abdomen that goes to your back. Mm. That is something that you want to watch out for. Mm -hmm. So we do scans uh, you know, an abdominal scan can show, you know, if there's something going on, but if you know, particularly if you don't have risk factors for diabetes, we know some of those risk factors are kind of being overweight and having some other things. If you don't have those risk factors and all of a sudden your blood sugars are going through the roof, I want you to think about, could this be a sign of pancreatic cancer? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it is one of the cancers that we have to catch early. Yeah. We still have lots of work to do with pancreatic cancer. So if yeah. we can catch it early and if you can go to surgery, that is the most ideal scenario. Yeah. Can I just add something about pancreatic cancer here? Mm -hmm. We're also yes. learning that that runs in families too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's a genetic yep. component that runs with breast cancer, right. mm -hmm. prostate cancer. It's that BRCA2 gene, exactly. right? Exactly. And Again, that goes back so to your family history. Family history. Right. Yes. yes. Really, right. really important. Because, because now with pancreatic cancer, we are checking for those genetic mutations and yes. we didn't do that all the time. So. That's right. Important yes. question, very important. Yes, yes, so thank you for bringing that up. And you know, I don't, we don't have time to go into the treatments and things like that, but let me point out a resource for you. There's, a, there's an organization called CanCan -Can, um, that's mm -hmm. like for pancreatic cancer. That organization does an amazing job They're very not good. only having wonderful resources in terms of educational resources for you, for your churches, um, but they also can really help to provide some one-on-one -on -one connection. So can can look them up, all right, and make sure that you know if you have any concerns about uh, pancreatic cancer, if you're undergoing, if you've recently been diagnosed and you, and you have questions, check them out. You know, I think we don't do that enough as as black people.
we don't we don't oftentimes go get into involved in like support groups or anything like that. And I'm not saying you got to sit around and do a kumbaya, right? But it's really important, and that's the whole reason why y'all are here, right? To learn about some of these things so you can take the information back to your congregants and to really have this this opportunity to really share the information. Mm -hmm. Um, I do want to talk a little bit, <clears throat> since we're talking about family history and the importance, because we're talking about all the genetic stuff, uh, Dr. Tiff, I want you to talk a little bit about clinical trials, because, you know, mm -hmm. you know, Dr. Zanetta kind of talked about the fact that, number one, iatrophobia is real, right? So fear of, medis of, the medis of medicine and medical physician practice, et cetera, is real because of some of the experimentation. And so when people hear the term clinical trial, yes. they're like, I know yeah. you're not having to be a guinea pig. So yeah. I want you to talk a little bit, though, about the importance of clinical trials, especially for Black people, because we're getting left behind. So talk a little bit about that. Okay. So the first thing to think about is that every cancer drug that we use came through a clinical trial, period. Okay. So all of these new drugs that have moved, you know, the cancer care forward and have impacted survival have come through a clinical trial. Now, the process of getting a drug through from a trial to an approved indication is years, sometimes a decade or more. So the, the folks who were on that trial that got that drug that turned out to be a game changer got it sometimes 10 years before everyone else did mm -hmm. to impact their cancer, okay? And so that's where I like to start in terms of thinking about what is one huge benefit of a cancer clinical trial. And it is just that, that a lot of times you are getting treatments years before they become standard of care. You are getting the cutting edge treatments and often um, a lot of the later stage trials, like the phase three trials, you're actually either getting whatever is already standard mm -hmm. or you're getting standard of care plus something that may benefit you. Okay, so if you have cancer, are you only ever gonna get a placebo? That's so, exactly what I was gonna say. Are, are you ever gonna get a sugar <laughs> no. pill alone? Okay, so so all y'all know- If there's a, a, no, no. If ahead. there's a standard of care, you will get the standard of care. Yes. The other thing is the way that trials are conducted now are so different uh, from in the past. So there is something called an IRB, which is an institutional review board. Anytime a trial um, is written or submitted to be open, it first goes to the IRB um, for review. Um, the other thing is that there is a process called informed consent, where it is your right to know everything um, that is going on with the trial. It is also your right to withdraw from the trial anytime you want to for any reason. Um, and the other thing to know is uh, there's something called a data safety monitoring board oftentimes in trials, which is called the DSMB. And the DSMB will take a look at the data and the safety as it goes on to see if there are any signals and if there are signals that there is a safety issue, oftentimes the DSMB will put that trial on pause mm -hmm. until they figure it out. And we yeah. can see this real time with the COVID vaccine yes. trials. Yes. That went, mm -hmm. one of the trials went on uh, went on a break for a little bit because the DSMB board saw some issues with muscle. But anyhow, um, so the point is that there are many checks there um, in the process to ensure patient safety. The benefit is um, that you are getting cutting age cutting edge care and often you're getting much more care, like you're getting more scans, you're getting more benefits in terms of participation. I want to talk about another um, kind of myth that comes up because we also hear often, right, that Black people don't participate in trials, but mm -hmm. what I hear from uh, Black cancer patients is we're not offered trials. You're not offered the trials. And so even when folks the want the clinical trial, mm. they're not offered the trial. Mm. And that that's one of the one of the places where bias in medicine comes in, yes. right? So, so this, this brings up up one of the things you're absolutely right that I want to talk to Dr. Z about because you know can you hear me yeah, yeah. Can you hear okay me? perfect Fine. what I want to do Dr. Z is have you talk a little bit about the importance of patient provider communication right so Dr. Tiff is talking about the fact that look half the time we're not even getting offered stuff right so it, and it goes to this mistrust issue right absolutely so let's be solution oriented here let's talk a little bit about the importance of patient provider communication and what are some tools that you kind of think sure. that our, our, our listeners can take back to their congregation so, you know, when I think about the, the patient physician or, or patient healthcare provider, um, I, I think of it as a relationship. 
It really is. And, and, and that relationship is formed based on trust. And so I'll be honest with you, most of, most of us oncologists, we went into oncology because we really care about our patients and we hate cancer, okay? And so one of the things that, that I, I see lacking sometimes is, is the empowerment. As a patient, you hold the power, right? And so one of the things that's important is that I always want you to know what is your diagnosis, right? So when you're going to a doctor's office, you want to know exactly what that person is treating you for. You know, sometimes people go to the doctor for years and years and years, and I've seen them and I'm, you know, taking over new patients and I say, okay, well, let's talk about your diagnosis, what's your understanding. And I hear a patient tell me, oh no, you just go through the blood work and then, and then tell me if it's okay. No, 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 no. That's not what we're going to do. No, 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 no. We are going to know what our diagnosis is. If you have a cancer, I want you to have a copy of the pathology report mm -hmm. because as you know, because that also helps with family history. Yes. Okay. Right. So, so wait, wait. If you, say that again mm -hmm. for the people in the back, please. You want to know your diagnosis. There is a pathology report that says your diagnosis. Then when you're talking paper. to your family, piece of paper, piece of paper, mm -hmm. when you're talking to your family and at the family reunion, because we've already agreed at the next family reunion, we're having a family history section right before the, the, the uh, Friday night or Saturday night banquet. Okay, we're going to have a family, Look, you're right, right before the banquet, we, wow. that's what we're going to do. And so, <laughs> and so you, you want to know what the diagnosis is. And one of the reasons I'm so big on knowing what your diagnosis is, because if you know what your diagnosis is, then you're empowered to ask questions. Yes about what's yes. going on with you. Yes. And, and I always say, you know, I, it's a relationship, but when you come into a room and you know your diagnosis and you know, hey, with this diagnosis, you can, you can look up some things. You, you, you're more empowered to ask questions. Mm -hmm. It actually shifts the dynamics of, 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 a, of a conversation. Because when I walk into a room with the patient, I don't have it on right now, but I wear my white coat. I get the big chair, you sit in the little chair. I am in a position of control. Mm. When you know what's going on with yourself and you say, hey, you know, you know what? I know I have an invasive ductal carcinoma of the left breast. And I want to talk to you about what my treatment options are. What kinds of endocrine therapy do you recommend? That's mm. when I say, let's, let's get it started. All let's right. roll, yeah. let's yeah, roll, it. let's <laughs> roll. There you go, right? right. Are there and, any clinical trials that I might Are be there any for? clinical yes. trials yes. available? And yeah. so from henceforth now and forevermore, I don't ever want you to go to a physician's office and not have a list of questions. Even if that question is, you know what, what is your goal? Yes. What is the goal of treatment? Yes. Because I'll be honest with you, everyone that we treat, our goal is not necessarily to take the cancer away. Sometimes our goal of treatment is cure. Sometimes our goal of treatment is, is to keep things stable for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. You want to know what the goals are. And why do you want to know what the goals are? We're talking to healthy churches. I have people ask me all the time, doc, what should I pray for? Right? How are you going to know what to pray for if you don't know your diagnosis? You don't even know what the goals are or the treatments are. So really, this helps you because yes. you're coming in, you're coming in, you're going to get your prayer, your prayer warriors together. Mm -hmm. You're going to pray for your medical team, but you're also going to pray, you know what, Lord, I have left, left invasive ductal carcinoma of the, of the breast. My doctor is telling me my prognosis is this, and I'm coming to you for this. Yes. So, um, you know, I really think if we could start there, if you could start with knowing exactly what you have, yes. and if you can be open to hearing what the, what the physician is telling you, mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. we say things that I don't, you know, it, it's not a comfortable conversation. Right, right. So Karen, I'm going point. to- No, to that point, we're, we're mm -hmm. going to questions. And I'm about to go into the Q&A. We're about to go to, oh. to the Q&A session. No, no, this is important. But one of the things that Dr. Z is talking about is number one, kind of knowing your diagnosis and asking questions. Sometimes when you hear the word cancer, your brain goes blank. Like you can't do it. Right. So part of what I want to make sure that 
everybody who's on this call today, if you go back to your congregation, the one thing that you can do is be a support for anyone that you know has cancer. First of all, though, people have to be open about it, right? And we know that that can sometimes be a struggle for us to admit when we have a diagnosis of cancer. So please be open, number one, if you have a cancer diagnosis with sharing. It doesn't share everybody. You don't have to get up on the pulpit and announce it to the whole world. But pick your few people that you might want to have a conversation with or your pastor and, and have somebody who can accompany you right. to these conversations. So when you're going on your initial consultation or when, when there might be a shift or a change in terms of treatment course or you're seeing a new doctor because cancer care is complicated. There are lots of right. doctors that are involved and our podcast will share some of that information. So please make sure you check out Three Black Docs. But it's really important to make sure you have someone who can accompany you and who can advocate on your behalf. Now, I want to go to the chat box, I mean, to the, to the Q&A session, because sure. there's some really good, interesting questions. We don't okay. have a whole lot of time, but um, I'm going to actually pose this first question to Dr. T. Um, so our, our, one of our first um, questions, he says, what is the best way for health ministries to advocate and support family and church members who are diagnosed with blood cancer? And they knew, so here's knowledge. They said one in eight women will be diagnosed. Yes, indeed. And it's higher in black women, right? And black women die at a rate of 40%. Higher than white women. Okay. And you mm. see, I put my glasses I'm getting old, y'all. All right. So, Dr. T. Yeah. What, what are some ways that people can advocate? So, one thing, you know, that the person who posed the question pointed out because they are already knowledgeable is that breast cancer is so common. Right. I bet you, with <clears throat> your church, if someone gets a diagnosis, I bet you there are others who have already had that diagnosis. Um, and so again, it is the idea of uh, being open because you probably have resources within your church to form support groups with folks who have already had breast cancer, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so just being able to talk to someone, I mean, could you imagine if someone who was in your church in you know, in your church family had already had that diagnosis and could offer support, kind of tell you with the ropes, what was going on, um, you know, and just offer that comfort, maybe be able to accompany them to visits. That would be mm, such a resource, awesome. you know? Yeah. But again, we got to put it out there, you know, and, and you might not want to get up on the pulpit and announce things, but I, I would bet you that there are other people who have already gone through that journey yeah. and what a support that could be, mm-hmm. um, you know, within the church community, yeah. right? Um, oh, go ahead. That you're just talking about even providing support, like with rides and things like that. Um, yeah. Dr. Z, any, any other? Yeah, you, you hear me over there because this is something yes. that is pertinent. I mean, before I started, you know, this webinar today, Something that uh, church ministries can help with is knowing the support within your local community, because something that we are seeing, especially with COVID, people Mm -hmm. are losing their jobs, Mm -hmm. they're losing their health insurance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the medications that we give in these high cost deductible insurance plans, Mm -hmm. they are breaking patients. So if you can find the networks for financial resources within your community, the oncology clinic will do it as well. Mm -hmm. But but that is something um, that that's something that could really, really be helpful. So, um, so really, so that so ministries actually can then look to see whether or not they can compile a list of local resources, transportation resources, exactly. food resources, right? Because nutrition exactly. is important during cancer care. Um, you know, if there are child care resources, if there's a young person who may have children, or maybe it's a grandparent who takes care of their grandkids, like right. those are the sorts of things that ministries can really do to help. Now, I'm going to pose the next question again. I'm going to go back to Dr. Tiffany because this is actually kind of relevant. Um, You know, are there resources or agencies that can can reference to help justify requests? So this is related to, you know, we were talking about if you have a family history of a cancer, Uh colorectal Mm -hmm. cancer or breast cancer, and the recommendation is for earlier screening. Mm -hmm. Are there any things that we can do to encourage primary care providers who oftentimes may not even be aware that black people are being recommended to get somebody screening at an earlier age. Yeah. Um, are there any, any recommendations around that? And this question was specific to gastric cancer. So I might throw that to you and, and Dr. Z. I think gastric cancer is one of those rarer cancers, but right. you know, so it can be harder to look for resources. But in general, what resources? Um, you mean for, 
for a patient who yeah like how can a patient that? advocate for themselves in terms yeah. of them being okay if they have a family history how do they go and approach their primary care doctor or get the screening that they need breast cancer is easy you don't need a private you don't need a doctor you just go and call the breast cancer that's right get screened but well first of all you come in with armed with the information hey this is what's going on in my family this cousin that cousin aunt mother I want to discuss this, but here's something that hasn't come up yet. If that person doesn't take you seriously, second opinion. Well, that's right. Always second opinion. Yeah. If you're, if you are diagnosed with cancer, second mm -hmm. opinion, no mm -hmm. good oncologist will have a problem with you getting a second opinion where you're diagnosed with cancer. But oh. also if you have a strong family history and your primary care doc is not putting you uh in in with the resources you need second opinion you know and and you just got to keep going and i hate that that's the answer because as we say this is on us in the medical community mm -hmm. um really and, and, and one thing that you can this, do because but, in in some communities too um sometimes it's hard to get in with a primary care physician so something that you can ask if you're saying hey you know what mm -hmm. i think i need to be screened for something earlier because of something in my family and you're getting pushback from the physician something you can ask is what are your concerns with me getting this particular screening yeah. right hear what they have to say about pros and cons and mm -hmm. if they don't have a good list of cons yeah, yeah. then you know sometimes that can help help them, you know, order what you need. Yes, yes. So that is so, so important. Now, there, it's, it's really, um, I do think that you have to learn how to advocate on, on your own behalf. But sometimes if you're not feeling well, it's hard to do that. So again, this Absolutely. is where the importance of having a friend or a family member who can advocate. But I agree with um, with Dr. Tiffany and Dr. G, always get a second. And if you feel like right. you have a doctor that's not listening to you, you need to find another. It's really important because you need to know you can trust that person, right? You right. need to know that you can trust that that person is going to, you know, have your best interests at heart. And so it is harder for tests that do require, like gastric cancer, again, is rarer. And so there may need to be some referrals to gastroenterologists. But right. And one of the things about gastric cancer, right? So if you're getting your colonoscopy on time and you're saying, hey, you know what? I'm having heartburn that won't go away. I'm getting full faster. I'm losing weight. You already have a, a, a gastro physician that's already set up. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's important to make some of these contacts early yeah. um, because then you can call that particular person and say, hey, I'm having these symptoms. Yeah, so true. it's always better to get plugged in early. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really, really good. Now, um, we don't have a whole lot of time left. So I do want to still encourage some of the folks who are watching and listening to go ahead and put your questions in. Because even if we don't get to them today, we're happy to kind of send a note afterward and respond to them later on. You guys can check us out at Three Black Docs. Again, podcast, we're at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And we have these conversations all the time, as you'll see. We even have some stuff on YouTube when we actually have guest speakers come in. Um, really important thing, um, you know, and I know Dr. Z, you talked about this. There's one person who talked about COVID kind of preventing family members from joining. And I want you to share your experience. I'll talk a little bit about my experience in, in kind of the clinic space, um, but talk a little bit about some of the things that you've personally done to ensure that patients who have to walk into your office solo still right. can have their family members as part of the conversation. Sure. So, you know, since the COVID pandemic, it's it's really changed the way that we practice medicine, right? And so we've had to be creative with some of the things that we're doing. Um, I've started having um, teleconferences with different family members in different places so that we can all, just like we're doing this webinar here, I have family conferences sometimes because I want every single family member to be involved and to understand what's going on. Unfortunately, in my clinic, because of COVID and because of the way our clinic is, um, patients have to come in by themselves. So um, in a former life, I used to be a receptionist. Who knew that knowing how to use a telephone and making conference calls would be so important because I have a, a, a conference phone in my room and we will connect anyone available. But also what I've done, I've had conversations in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's not ideal, but yeah. we're really trying to do anything and everything that we can. Yeah. Um, COVID is, we're in the third wave. I actually got an email yesterday mm. that it's projected that 150,000 more people will die. Yeah, this is really, really. And, 
And, and so um, it's heartbreaking, it's preventable, but I don't want you to stop getting the care that you need. Right. We are here, we are working, we're working through it. So yes, uh, yes. we still wanna take care of yes. you. Because cancer doesn't care about COVID. It's still gonna it do does not care. And so we still need to make sure we're getting our screenings done and we still need to make sure that we're getting treatment if we do have a cancer diagnosis. And so please relay that to your congregations. We are doing everything we can to keep folks safe, including sometimes restricting family members our institution had opened up and started to allow one individual to come and accompany during the during the meetings um, because it is important. And we actually treat a lot of folks in rural communities who didn't have really good access to telemedicine. You hear that that's like right. the end all be all, and it's not. Like telemedicine and telehealth doesn't work for everybody. They may not have broadband access. Right. And, and it is being telehealth. underutilized in the black yeah. community. Yes. So I think there are some things to think about. Um, I'm going to go to one more question before we actually do a wrap up. And so. Um, I think that it's really important, again, um, folks, we really appreciate all of you being here. This is really important information. An hour is just not long enough to talk about all the things we could. So please make sure you check out our podcast. Um, but I think one of the things, um, and Tiff, I'm going to go to you on this because you might have a better um, handle on in terms of the, the list of, of cancer screening recommendations that are specific to Blacks. Now, I think the American Cancer Society probably has the most relevant, but I wanted to point to you because I know that you've done a little bit more research recently mm -hmm. about that. Yep. So is the question where folks should go? Yeah. Like um, if there's a list to compile, you know, yeah. a, a uh -huh. American Cancer Society. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So cancer.gov. Um, I also like actually the NCCN. So the, the NCCN is the National um, Comprehensive Cancer Network. They make um, recommendations for patients as well. Um, and I've found that their recommendations across the board also tend towards the younger ages um, of starting. Um, screenings, which is more pertinent for us. So I think either American Cancer Society or um, NCCN for patients, um, their screening guidelines are good resources. Awesome. awesome, awesome, very good. I mean, we talked about so much. We talked about so much today, y'all. And so again, I think, you know, from my perspective, I think um, I'm again, very grateful for those of you who selected this session. I do hope that folks who may not have been able to watch this live will kind of check in and listen later on. Hopefully you'll find some pearls in here that you can take back. Again, you can find us on Facebook and there's a lot of information that we actually post on Facebook online and post, uh, post on our Simplecast website, which is where our, our podcast is housed. Although the podcast is available anywhere where you get it. I actually get it on my phone. So if you have an iPhone and you have podcasts, you can search for us at Three Black Docs and you can hook us up there. All right, so please make sure you like, listen, and subscribe. Let your congregants know, have them follow us. You've got three black doctors in your back pocket. All of us are oncologists and we want to serve you. And we want to serve your community. So please Absolutely. check this out. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of questions coming in. Please keep it going. One of the questions that came in is, is around um, the clinical trials piece. And there's two things. And, and Tiff, you might want to speak to this too in just mm -hmm. a minute. But one of them was related to our doctors supposed to invite people to um, participate in clinical trials. Unfortunately, there's no rule or regulation around that. And not every place has clinical trials at Yale, okay? Right, so that's yeah. one of the challenges in, that yeah. we face, particularly in the Black community, is that oftentimes clinical trials are not located where we are. Doesn't mean that, you know, there aren't people who aren't being asked, you know, who do go to these places. And so that's one of the challenges. So just so you know, that's one thing. But the other question was really around getting onto the IRBs and, and kind of getting it as a layperson. We absolutely need lay people on IRBs. Tiff, did you want to add anything? Um, oh, yeah. I couldn't yeah. hear the first part of your question. I'm sorry. I haven't trouble with audio, but yes, uh, there are um, opportunities for lay folks uh, to participate. Was that the question? Yes. In IRBs? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And um, if you and, and I would encourage that, um, you know, especially for black folks. And listen, the more of us that are participating in IRBs and actually can see the behind the scenes of what goes on, the better, because then you can go back out to the community and kind of, you know, answer the questions and allay the fears. You know, a lot of times I had try, um patients, um, you know, black patients who I spent, you know, <sighs> an hour or two talking about a clinical trial. Um, and finally, the person wanted to get on it after we understood everything and did everything. And then when they came back, someone at home said, don't let them make you a guinea pig. And then mm -hmm. they said, I, I don't, I don't want to participate. And that was it. So, 
So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of just educating as a whole. So yeah, I would love that. And then once you learn, go out and tell everyone else. So So if there's a cancer center that's near you, you can actually call them up and ask them if they have an institution or review board and see what their requirements are for that. And the reason why clinical trials are so important, Dr. Z, we are getting left behind. Black folks are getting left behind. And our bodies respond differently for whatever reason, whether it be the external stresses or whether it be genetic changes that we don't know about. So it's really vital, right, that people get engaged in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Critically important. Critically important. Um, Because like Dr. Tiffany said, every single thing that I do in oncology it's because of the people who participated in the clinical trials. The reason in breast cancer we're doing lumpectomies and not these big surgeries that we're disfiguring is because brave women participated in clinical trials. The reason why we know about prostate cancer, even though we need to know more, Mm -hmm. is, is because of people who participated in clinical trials. So everything that I'm doing is because of the people that came um, before you. So it's incredibly important. And, and now a lot of the, the community senators have clinical trials open. I'm an yeah. oncologist and actually we're, um, my research nurse is calling someone as we speak <laughs> to, to let them know that, hey, you know what, you're eligible for a clinical trial. So awesome. um, yeah. it, it's, in, it's incredibly important. You're, you're in Naples, I'm just saying. Um, <clears throat> there aren't a whole lot of us there. <laughs> just saying. Um, uh, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I can't we'll talk about that, that tomorrow. So, but that's yeah, another podcast. That so, but let me tell you. So here's the deal. The reason why I'm bringing up and, and kind of ending on clinical trials is that COVID is impacting Black and Brown communities at a much higher rate than any other community, and we are not represented. Just the same way that some of the guidelines around cancer screening were based mostly on white people. And that's why they're like, okay, you don't have to do breast rate screening until age 50. No, doesn't apply to black folks. And you know why we don't have a lot of data? Because a lot of us weren't included in those clinical trials. So make it your prerogative to really seek out clinical trials. Because number one, you'll get better access to drugs and therapies potentially, but you also are going to be part of solution. So please make sure that you guys have the information that you need around clinical trials and what that means. And especially in this COVID era, I'm very concerned that there won't be enough uptake of the vaccine and that we are going to further widen the gap that we see. We're going to further make it such that Black people are going to die from COVID at much higher rates. So we need to do what we can, whether it be to participate in a treatment trial, a vaccine trial, or really kind of start to talk to our congregations about being willing to accept the vaccine. Trust me when I say this, there is so much more oversight. There's been so much misinformation. I understand the distrust, the mistrust, the lack of trust. I understand it all. They're all different things and I understand them all. We've had a hot mess of an administration kind of dealing with this COVID thing from a federal perspective. So I understand it, but there are good people who are working on this and who are really hoping to solve this problem. So please, please, please consider not only joining a clinical trial, but then also thinking about how we can do our best to surround this COVID thing. All right, we've got five minutes. So anytime we throw this much information at y'all, we want to make sure you guys have a takeaway. So Dr. Ted, what's one takeaway that you want to make sure that people who are listening go away with when we're talking about cancer in the Black community? You're gonna get mad at me because I have two. You always do. You always get mad at me. But <laughs> one, never. <laughs> well, because okay, I, but I'll be quick. I'll be quick. Okay, the first thing is know your family history and how it might impact your screening and get your screenings. The second thing, Karen, I forgot. I am now a board certified lifestyle medicine physician too. Oh, I have yes. to remember this now since yes. I just found board this out certified. days ago or something. Mm-hmm. So I would be remiss if I didn't say anything about prevention, right? Cancer yes. prevention. Yeah. Oh, um, and okay. so again, it is, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I knew you couldn't be too mad at me. No. Um, and so again, <laughs> for us to feel empowered, like we know all this information. What can I do to prevent cancer? What can I do to catch it early? To catch it early, we talked about your screening. Prevention, it is maintaining a normal weight. So I love that you started off talking about um, your weight loss. Uh, We do know that lots of cancers are associated with obesity. So it's maintaining a normal weight. It is getting physical activity regardless of what it does to your weight just the just the impact of moving your body quickly tiffany what is the physical week, activity 150 minutes a week um where where you are breathing hard where you can talk about um 
looking at your alcohol consumption, avoiding excess alcohol, of course, not smoking or quitting if you do smoke, um, and watching your meat consumption. That's all. Yeah, I'm done. I, I, I take offense to the last, the whole meat. <laughs> I didn't, I, you talking about that on our meat. podcast too. Listen to uh, our here whole, we go like, with the meat to fight. Our, listen to our podcast on whole <laughs> cancer. Okay, you can see where where we depart. Like we always talked about, we all have different ways of looking at things. But I'm just saying, if it makes you feel any better, I had a piece of bacon at lunch yesterday. Oh, look at that. All right, <laughs> all right, Doctor Z. What's your takeaway? What's so your takeaway empower yourself. You and your physician are in a relationship know your diagnosis. We all know God is the great physician, right? He's the great physician. However, there are little physicians like us who are here. We are here to help you along your journey, okay? So be empowered, know your diagnosis, go into that clinic with a list of questions, come out of that clinic visit with a list Mm, of answers. mm, mm. Yes, yes, yes. Love it, love it. Dr. Karen, what's your takeaway? Well, mine is that... Cancer is not a death sentence. We didn't talk about that, but obviously all of this that we're talking about, when we talk about prevention or risk reduction, let's say risk reduction, uh, when we talk about the importance of screening, when we talk about the importance of treatment and knowing what your diagnosis is, uh, thinking about entering into clinical trials, all of this is because we know that if cancer is found, is prevented, but if it's found early, and you get the appropriate treatment, there is a wonderful chance that you can get cured. Not for every cancer. We're still, like you said, we have some work to do with pancreatic cancer, but early detection is key. And even when we talked about what congregations can do and in terms of even providing support, if there are individuals who are willing to share their cancer story, the reason why that's important, because it highlights the fact that cancer is not a death sentence. We have people who've been living for decades with cancer. And mm-hmm. even in the metastatic setting, somebody had asked a question about metastatic breast cancer and are we seeing it more? I think yes and no. I mean, again, people die of metastatic cancer or, you know, if they're dying from, from a cancer diagnosis. So what we do know is that black women are dying of breast cancer more. So that does mean that they have more instances of metastatic breast cancer. That's been for a while. I think you're hearing about it more, which is good. That means we need, we're talking about it. We're sharing our stories. And that's an important thing. So cancer is not a death sentence. I just want to thank all of you again for being here today, for listening. I hope that you are able to take away some good information, right? To take back to your congregants, please, please, again. And you know, I'm, I'm up here. I'm like really talking up three black dots because I do feel like, as you know, um, I've been passionate about this area in terms of education outreach for many, many years. And for me to have stumbled across Dr. Tiffany and, and Dr. Zanetta, who have that same passion, talk about Providence, right? This with me. Absolutely. Be. And so we just want you to come on in, listen to our conversation, join the conversation. We have live sessions. We may be thinking about changing the day, but we have lives where you can toss in your questions and things like that. Mm-hmm. Now, we're not going to answer specific questions about your cancer diagnosis. We can't do that if we're not practicing in your state, right? Like, you can't do that. It's illegal, y'all. Yeah, but don't don't get us him. Don't, though, yeah, don't, please. Please don't get us. Him. <laughs> but we are there for you to provide that information, provide some questions that you can go to your team with. And we just want to thank you so much for being here today. And so I think our time is just about up. But um, I, I just I don't know if Kirby is still on. But again, want to thank all of you guys for being here.